Um, this brings us to the keynote address of this session, and somebody who is very much known in my what is now my hometown. Some of you, as I mentioned earlier, some of you, I expect many of you have been to see uh, the protests that are happening right now in Hong Kong. Can I see a show of hands? If, if anybody has had a chance to go down and visit the, oh, it's called Occupy Central, the Umbrella Movement. I see a few hands. If you haven't gone, everybody that is in this room today absolutely must go. Okay. <laughs> you picked a great time to be here. I know you couldn't have planned for it because these things take many, many months in the planning, but you have come at the right time. The democratic movement in Hong Kong has erupted onto the streets. It has seized them. It slowed up your bus a little bit today. But frankly, I think a little bit of traffic is worth the price if we can get some advancement of the democratic movement in Hong Kong. So I hope you're not too perturbed at having your, your session played a little bit. That movement has continued into the modern era because of the persistence, because of the insistence of the next speaker that is coming to you now. By way of explanation, you need to understand a little bit about Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, uh, we have a chief executive, and most of the power uh, in terms of control of the government is held by the chief executive, and that is at the heart of what the protests are about in the street. We also have a legislature here in Hong Kong, which I think you're going to find it a little bit more today. It's not exactly bicameral, but there are two different types of legislative councils, functional, which are elected by a small group of voters, which by and large can be you know, safely controlled in enough numbers by uh, people up in the north. And then there are the geographical, geographically elected uh, legislative councillors. They are the real deal. Your next speaker is the real deal. <laughs> now you've all read the agenda, so you know who I'm talking about. She has studied and lectured on journalism on three continents, worked at the BBC, locally with TVB, in addition to being a leading light of democracy in Hong Kong, she also keeps an eye on China as the Deputy Chair of the China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group. Please help me welcome somebody that is, for the 20, almost 20 years that I have been in Hong Kong, she has been a leading light and an inspiration. Please help me welcome your keynote address, Emily Lau Y. Ping. expected a huge assembly, and the police, the police said, no, you can't, 
because that's an illegal assembly, and you are not allowed to take the equipment in for that illegal assembly. I said, no, I'm going to do it. He said, you're not. I said, I am. There were five of us, apart from myself, there's my colleague, Albert Hall, also a Democratic Party legislator, and another legislator from the Labour Party, Dr. Fernando Jo, and there was also a Professor Joseph Chang, and also my colleague, uh, Dr. Yeung Sa. So we said, we're going to push them in. He said, no way. And they said, we are going to confiscate the sound equipment. I said, you're not. I said, I'm going to push them in. He said, no. He said, you're under arrest. Because we are going to confiscate the equipment and you want to push them in. So we were arrested that morning at around noon. And there were actually quite a number of people there helping to push the equipment in. And before we got into the police car, we told them, we said, please, please stay calm. I know they were very angry. But I said, stay calm. Don't fight with the police. So we got arrested. And we stayed there until around 11 p.m. And when we came out, they had already fired the tear gas. 87 rounds. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all because we want, we want more freedom. We want democracy and less inequality. Because we have not got a democratic system, that's why our policies are so much skewed towards the business community. But don't get me wrong, I am very, very much in favor of a business-friendly environment so that investors from all over the world will come to invest in Hong Kong to do business here and to prosper. How else would we find employment for my people? But for so many years, we've been denied the right to elect the government. And this time round, Beijing promised us that in 2017, we can elect the chief executive, who is the head of the executive authorities, by universal suffrage. Right now, the chief executive is C.Y. Lerb, and he was chosen in March of 2012 by a committee of 1,200 people, mainly drawn from what Andrew described as the functional constituencies, meaning the big business, small business, the professional people. And but Beijing said, okay, in 2017, you may choose the chief executive by universal suffrage. So we all said, oh great. And then on the 31st of August, the National People's Congress Standing Committee, that is China's parliament, the rubber stamp of parliament, made a decision saying, yes, you can elect the chief executive by universal suffrage in 417. But there will be a nominating committee, which is also in the basic law our mini-constitution, promulgated by Beijing in 1990. It refers to a nominating committee. And Beijing said this nominating committee will be constituted the same way as the election committee that elected C.Y. in 2012. So that means it still will be controlled by a clique of business and professional people. Mainly, of course, very close to the uh, property tycoons. And what's more, to be validly nominated as a candidate, you need the support of more than half of the members of the committee. So if you have 1,200, you need at least 601 votes to be nominated. And to add insult to injury, you can have at most three candidates two or three candidates. So when that was announced, many people very angry, shocked, and some were in tears. In tears because they had trusted Beijing. They thought that we will have genuine election. But when they saw that, 
they knew that it would not be. It would be just a process controlled by Beijing and his tycoon and their tycoon friends. So that's why the people demonstrated and we have the Occupy Central movement, which did not have a chance to start because they wanted to start it on the 1st of October. But we had the students boycotting classes and then the crowd swell. And then uh, we have the tear gas and we have the Occupy movement. So how is it going to end? I don't know. We wanted to talk to the authorities. But the chief secretary, Carrie Lam, turned us down. They had talks with the students only once. The students wanted to talk again. They refused. Now the students are planning to go to Beijing. And the people in the streets, they don't want to leave. So, how are we going to end this? I don't want violence. I don't want bloodshed. Many journalists, foreign journalists, came. They were stunned. Why? These journalists were covering Afghanistan, Ukraine, uh, Iraq, <laughs> in Africa, elsewhere, where there's so much bloodshed and slaughtering and beheading. And when they come to tiny little Hong Kong, so peaceful, just umbrellas. <laughs> so, but this, this is very precious. As I told my friends from Global Bridges this morning, the international community should encourage this, particularly in a world full of violence and slaughter. Those people are also struggling for democracy and human rights. But here, my people have chosen to struggle with peace and non-violence. So I don't know what, I guess there are two groups here actually, Carl and Deirdre. I don't know what you're going to say at the end of the conference, whether you're going to say anything at all. Today, some of you are featured in the newspaper because it's newsworthy, but also because Beijing is very worried about foreign interference. And uh, that you have chosen. Actually, you did when you chose the day. You didn't know that this is happening. <laughs> but anyway, now it has happened, and you are here. Of course, many people are looking at you with uh, <laughs> with very close interest to see whether you will really dare to interfere in Hong Kong and China's affairs. But to me, as a human rights defender and somebody who's worked for democracy for so long. I always say that human rights and democracies transcend <laughs> national boundaries. And people all over the world <laughs> care about it. And so I, that my friends from the Global Bridges asked me, well, do you think we in Germany, what, what should we do? I said, it's not a question of what you should do, what me telling you what you do. It's what you think as a decent, upstanding human being when you see such things happening, that you decide what to do. And so, my dear friends, you are here in the thick of things, and uh, no doubt you will enjoy yourself. And I certainly hope that before you leave, you will leave some remarks for your friends who are struggling for democracy and human rights here, and for Dr. Chi, of course, we always have, have you know, we tried very hard to help Singapore, and when I saw him, I said, we're actually moving closer to each other, Dr. Chi, because we will be in jail soon. <laughs> so, anyway, my dear friends, welcome to Hong Kong. Welcome to this fight for democracy and freedom. And I hope you will all fight for us. Thank you very much. Emily Lau is perhaps the only one in Hong Kong. Yeah, one more time for our keynote speaker.